So hi everybody, welcome to this month's uh, Bioconductor Developers Forum. Um, we've got a bit of a change from the previous few months where we've been focusing really deep down inside R. Um, this time we're taking a bit more of a high level view of uh, how we might apply it to um, real data sets um, and that kind of approach, uh, how it can help us, how other people can help us use R in better ways. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jas Bagger and Erdal Kosgen uh, from Microsoft Genomics, which is um, part of the Microsoft Research uh, arm, wing, I don't know quite what the right terminology is, but it's Microsoft Research here. Um, and they've been working uh, in collaboration with some members of the Bioconductor core team, um, principally on um, uh, applying uh, R and other open source tools within the Azure cloud framework and things. So it's my pleasure to let them show the work they've been doing here. Um, and I think what they're hoping to get out of this is um, feedback from us as users and developers on how we can use their platform to advertise them to us um, and also to look hopefully for collaborations where maybe um, we want to work on things using their tools and things. So um, with that hopefully okay introduction, um, please take it away, Jas, if you're sharing first. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jess. So I will start the introduction from our side. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so thanks for your invite, um, Martin, uh, Nitesh, and Mike. So uh, and we are really happy to share our collaborations, the initial phase, the first phase. Uh, and then uh, we have a really good opportunity to share uh, what we are working on with R and with other open source um, tools uh, for genomics. Uh, in the first round, uh, in the first slide, um, I will uh, just briefly talk about what we are working on, uh, because as you know, uh, genomics is a very wide area. So we, we have different collaborations uh, with open source communities or the other uh, projects in the world. And most of them focus on these areas uh, in the real applications, uh, like early detection for uh, specific diseases or specific uh, genetic um, rare diseases. Uh, one of them is the uh, sudden infant death prediction models uh, with uh, R and with Python again uh, in uh, Azure today. Uh, we have a different disease uh, predictions for the uh, including infants or the other uh, ages uh, and it's a very important uh, uh, way to share our uh, tools and our um, scientific uh, outco outcomes and outputs. Uh, for personalized treatments or targeted drugs and gene therapies, there are the well-known terminologies, uh, but we would like to uh, find our new collaborations uh, within the bioconductor community, definitely. And uh, if you're interested in these kind of uh, projects, definitely we'll be happy to share the other details. Uh, in the next slide, I will uh, just briefly talk about what we are going to talk today. Uh, as a Microsoft Genomics team, as Mike mentioned, we are a research team. Uh, we are creating a solutions for our stakeholders, for our partners, uh, and uh, we separated these solutions into three. The first one is the research and discovery, and we mostly focus on today uh, for this part. Uh, the genomics notebooks uh, for Azure, the bioconductor on Azure, uh, and Jess will explain uh, the bioconductor images that we are uh, providing in the MCR, the Microsoft Container Registry. Uh, we have a genomics data science VM, uh, which covers most of the tools for uh, the data science, the genomics data science, plus the bioconductor integration, including the image. And we have a genomics data lake. Uh, it's a public repo for the uh, reference genomes for annotations. So uh, we will show you the Jupyter notebooks that we prepared for combining the bioconductor image, or you can definitely use any bioconductor packages on the Jupyter notebook uh, and combine with our uh, the public data sets. For automation and uh, scale part, uh, we have a Cromwell and Azure, and Jess will explain uh, briefly, uh, but we have a, a Cromwell implementation, the special Cromwell implementation for Azure, 
uh, is scalable. So um, we will talk about it too. And for the uh, commercial part, we have a Microsoft Genomic Service. I will, we will not talk about it today uh, because this is a commercial service. We don't want to talk about it. Uh, we will just focus on our collaboration with the uh, bioconductor community. And for Microsoft Genomic Service, this is just the one API for doing alignments and variant calling. It's the best practices uh, from Broad Institute, the BWAG ATK. So just uh, probably you can continue with uh, the Microsoft Container Registry. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jazz, and I'm an engineer on the genomics team. And um, I will begin by talking about the collaboration with Bioconductor. Um, and what we've done for hosting the Docker image that uh, Bioconductor releases uh, onto the Microsoft um, Container Registry. So really quickly, what is Microsoft Container Registry? It is a um, registry for all Microsoft published Docker images. So it's backed by Microsoft. So you, it's reliable and trustworthy delivery of images. Um, it relies on the Azure CDN, um, so you can expect it to be fast and have a really tight integration with all other Azure services and products. So if you are familiar with Azure and if, if you've used Azure ML or um, if you've run Python notebooks in the, in the Azure cloud, um, the Microsoft Container Registry has a really good integration with all of those products. Um, and there's also a lot of security researchers and um, others that work at Microsoft that focus on um, container security as well. So there's the added benefit of using these images. Some of the frequently asked questions is how is this different from Docker Hub? Um, so MCR, Microsoft Container Registry, um, it houses all of the Microsoft published images, so the official source of Microsoft images, so any product that has an image um, is hosted here. Um, but it does not have a catalog UI experience. So we've actually collaborated with the Docker Hub team to um, make it so that all of these images are discoverable on Docker Hub. But they're, and in fact, they're actually being hosted on the Microsoft Container Registry. And we will actually see it. Uh, I'll show you a web page where you can find the bioconductor image on Docker Hub. Um, and what is the difference between MCR and ACR? So if you are familiar with Azure and if you've used Azure in the past, you might have seen Azure Container Registry. And the difference here is that Azure Container Reg Registry focuses on customer-owned Im images. So if you create something that you want to stay private um, and you want to use within your team, then that's when you can use ACR. So really quickly, here's a little screenshot of um, Docker Hub where you can find the officially hosted um, image for Bioconductor. Um, so this image actually lives on MCR, so you'll see it's slightly different here. When you create a Docker pull, um, you're actually going on to mcr.microsoft.com to pull in the Bioconductor image. And you can use whatever tag you want. And, latest is the default. So just a few dev notes. Um, so we update this um, periodically. So as soon as there is a new release on the official bioconductor image, we update the Microsoft Container Registry with that. We have um, the de devel image, the devel tag for the bioconductor image updated every Monday. So we give it a couple of days to make sure there were no um, breaking um, changes and like, not breaking changes, but like things that broke the pipeline on the bioconductor side and we give it a couple of days. So on Monday, automatically we pull the latest image and we host it on MCR. Um, there are also basic instructions on how to pull this image um, and when all of the tags were last updated on this page. Um, there's also uh, instructions on how you can run this interactively in RStudio. This is the bioconductor.org page. Uh, we have a section in the help docker um, subpage for Microsoft where we focus on 
all these instructions again, but we also talk about how you can take your files and persist that analysis data between sessions. So if you are running a container and you perform analysis, but then you stop the container, um, how can you come back to it and keep using the same data um, persistent across your sessions? And we'll, the, the example uses Azure File Share for that, and we and this page actually goes through the required steps to take in order to set that up. There's also a section for using the Azure command line interface on how you can start, stop, restart your containers in the cloud. Okay, so I'm going to quickly jump um, two web pages on a short demo, and we'll come back to the slideshow. So this is the bioconductor image hosted on Docker Hub. And this is what you can expect when you go to this page. You will see how to pull the image how to run RStudio interactively for, for this Docker container. There's also a listing of all of the tags that we've released and the last updated times. And we're always looking for feedback, so if you have any, you can contact us through an email if you've used this image and if there have been issues or something that doesn't work quite as expected, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And here we're looking at the help Docker page. If you scroll down to here, you'll see that there is a section for Microsoft. Um, and here we're talking about Azure Container Instances. Now what are Azure Container Instances? Um, after this short section on MCR, which we just talked about, you'll see what Container Instances are. It's a way to run the bioconductor image on demand in a managed serverless environment. So you wouldn't have to spin up a VM and then go into the VM to pull this image and start working with it. Azure Container Instances provides a way for you to quickly get started um, without setting up the infrastructure required to run this image. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, um, there's this page you can go to, and there's a short video you can watch to familiarize yourself with what Azure containers, con container instances are. And if you keep scrolling, you'll see um, instructions on how to persist data. There are a lot of Azure concepts here, so I um, suggest that if you are not familiar with them, that you click on these links that take you to the documentation for each of these and how to do these. Um, but I will also show you an example of this um, in my demo, but here we're setting up um, something called a storage account um, in the cloud. So in Azure, we're creating a storage account using our Azure CLI, we're creating something called a file share, which is where your files will go that you can then use through your image. So you can th use through RStudio or your terminal. Um, and you're getting the storage key, which you're then using to mount this storage place. Um, and this goes through all of the various ways you can customize your instance in the cloud. Um, you'll notice that this is the MCR hosted image. You can give it a name. Um, you have to choose where in your Azure environment you want this to be created. You can customize how big of a machine you need to do your analysis. Um, and if you mount something to this machine and then later you want to use a bigger machine, you can create another inst Azure Container instance with a bigger machine and mount it to the same storage. Um, and that way you'll be able to keep using the, your, your data files 
even if you change the container instance. We're also setting some environment variables. You can customize these as much as you like. Um, and we're then spinning it up and going on to our studio at this fully qualified domain name that we get once we spin this up. There's also instructions on how to use the command line interface to stop a container, start, restart, delete, and so on. Okay. So this is an example of trying out this uh, set of instructions. So here, just to clarify, I'm using PowerShell, but the instructions on the web page are for Ubuntu. So the Azure command line works across all OS platforms, so you're welcome to use whatever you're comfortable with. And the only differences here and the instructions on the web page would be the syntax for PowerShell. So here, ACI is Azure Container Instances, Purse is Persistent, and the rest of this is um, Resource Group is a very Azure-specific term. It's basically a container, a logical container of um, Azure services that you can put together in one place. So in my instance, I will create um, an Azure container instance. So that would be one service I create under this resource group. The other thing I would create is um, the file share. So that can all go under this uh, logical container of th this resource group. I'm choosing a storage account name, a location, and I'm giving my file share a name. So just to clarify, I will not be running anything live, but I did this last night. And the reason is because some of these steps take a few minutes. Um, and if you try it out on your own uh, and you find anything that is concerning, please let us, let us know. Um, but here I'm walking you through the steps um, and we'll see the persistent storage in action. Here I'm creating the resource group that I would like to put my resources in. I'm then creating a storage account where I want my file share to live. You'll get this output. Um, you can move past that. You don't have to pay too much attention to it. One thing I would like to call out is the location bit is this is an example. This is the closest location to me, but Azure has data centers across the world, so you're, you're free to use whatever location fits your needs. Um, and there's a whole bunch that I'll show later. Um, okay. Here I'm uh, creating a file share that I want to mount to my container instance. And then I'm creating this container. I'm giving it a few of the parameters that we've seen. I'm opening up port 8787. And I'm giving it the mount path. So I want the home R Studio mount path to be mounted onto my container. And you can customize this however you need. This is an example of um, file path in R Studio that I thought I wanted to mount. And once it's in the running state, you'll get some certain output. So this might take a couple minutes, depending on how busy the, the region is and the kind of um, VM that um, you require based on your CPU requirements and such. And once it's spinning, I can go to this website and see RStudio in action. Let me go there. So here I am on this web address at port 8787. The username is the same as the 
bioconductor image, so we've kept it at our studio. When I spun up this container, I chose this as my password. And here you can see that there is a file that I've created in Home R Studio. Let's see if this is visible in the cloud. So this is the file share that I had created, which has this created file that's also on the RStudio server. Um, so if I open it and download it, you'll see the same content. And if we upload a file here, this is in the file share in the Azure portal cloud. And if we go back to our studio, click on home again, you'll see that it has appeared. So this is mounted storage. You can make changes in our studio or in the cloud or you could imagine other processes and other team members making those changes um, or creating some files in your um, file share, which you can then access from your uh, session. Um, and like I said, you could stop this container and start it again and these files would persist because they're actually being backed by this cloud location. So if you go to portal.azure.com, um, you can create this um, the Azure Container instances through the UI. Um, there's a lot of documentation if you um, go to docs.microsoft.com. Um, so right here, you'll see how to do it in different ways. You can use CLI, but you can also do it through the UI, whatever you're comfortable with. So you can imagine uh, other people creating some files that you want to analyze, and you can have this shared location that you've mounted and you can keep using it between sessions and with other um, um, container instances with maybe bigger machines because you realize I need more power um, and you can mount the same storage onto a new instance and keep using it. So um, that's it for the demo. I'll go back to the slides. Uh, until that part, uh, do we have any questions? You can please feel free to interrupt us. Uh, we can, we will be happy yes. to answer it. Is the storage mounted as a POSIX file system? You can do the usual sorts of things. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I can look into that for you, sorry. Ardell, did you want to? Ah, yeah, can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, perfect. So uh, thank you, Jess. So for the next step, um, I would like to show you how can we use this uh, MCR um, Docker image, uh, sorry, the Bioconductor image, and how can we use and recommend it to our stakeholders? So um, there is a, uh, repo that is open source, you can visit and use it anytime, the Microsoft slash genomics notebook. Uh, and we are maintaining different notebooks in here. Uh, so you don't need any other account for using these notebooks. You can use these uh, implementations on your uh, HPC, on your PC or anywhere that you would like to use. So we have nine different notebooks, but I would like to focus on uh, the first one, uh, the, the boy conductor Jupyter notebook and the uh, public data set notebook that you can use this uh, bioconductor image uh, with the public uh, data sets that we are uh, sharing today. Uh, it's open source and it's free. So for the bioconductor Jupyter notebook, I think it's very similar uh, to the uh, demo uh, that Jess made, uh, but it 
it's just a Jupyter environment. So you can pull and do the same thing with the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, most of our stakeholders would like to use that uh, Jupyter notebook for pulling the image and uh, continue to use their uh, Jupyter notebooks and their codes. So it's the very similar uh, details, but with the links and the, uh, if they or the users would like to download this Jupyter notebook, they can directly use uh, and pull the image and continue to use the Jupyter uh, notebook cells. So uh, this is the notebook uh, that we are providing. And uh, one of the important uh, reasons that we added this notebook, this short notebook to this repo is we have the public repo. Uh, the public uh, genomics data sets, including platinum genome, uh, the reference genomes, the clean noir, the genome in a bottle, and the SNPF. So uh, all these uh, data sets are public, therefore you can easily use these notebooks and combine with your uh, the bioconductor image. Let's say if you would like to use any of these um, uh, public data sets. Uh, there is a specific link that you can download separately. Uh, here it is. These are the list of the data sets that we are sharing, but you don't need to go to this page uh, or this open data set uh, link. You can directly go to the sample notebooks for how can you download uh, the specific open data sets uh, and import it to your environment. Uh, this is a, a public data set. You don't need to use anything. Uh, the, the SAS tokens are public. Uh, you just need to download this uh, specific um, data sets notebook and uh, use for your analysis. So one of the important part of uh, these public data sets is uh, you can continue to use any other tool, including Bioconductor, because it's Jupyter, so you can continue to use all of them. But the main idea is uh, you can combine uh, the two or three different notebooks or the cells and use it for your uh, research uh, purposes. So uh, I'm running a separate project with the SNPF, uh, uh, SNPF uh, database and SNPF uh, project. So it's the same again. So if you would like to use uh, any R packages or bioconductor packages and would like to annotate your data, uh, still, uh, you don't need to leave uh, the other, leave the uh, specific environment that you are using. You can directly call the annotation uh, databases and the SNPF uh, from your uh, notebook. Um, for the uh, next phase of these notebooks are, uh, we uh, created a bioconductor image and uh, at the same time, people need the virtual machines. So it's not free, definitely it's a Azure virtual machine, but we created a template for the uh, genomics users and researchers. Uh, the high level architecture is, uh, we already have a data science VM template, but we don't have any genomic specific tools on these VMs. Therefore, we created a different uh, notebook uh, use cases, uh, the GATK, uh, and the, the specific deep learning and machine learning tools on this VM. Uh, the main idea behind this genomic data science VM and the relation with, with the bioconductor is, so we have a centralized uh, storage account. So once the user uh, deployed these uh, data science VM images, uh, this image will directly call the content that we are sharing uh, for the users. So let's say uh, we have two options. You can deploy the Windows Server 2016, and here is the package and the tool list in this VM. These are the regular um, tools uh, like the Jupyter Notebooks or uh, TensorFlow uh, or any uh, Julia uh, packages. You will directly get all these packages in this image, plus uh, the, you, the users will see the GATK uh, on their VM, and I will show, it, show the screenshots of these VMs, and they will find the Microsoft Genomics uh, notebooks, and we have a built-in file, not the direct packages or any specific package, but direct uh, specific shell file that people can uh, pull or call the bioconductor packages. So uh, we are not owning any package or uploading any package to VM, but we are showing to the customer and recommend, recommend to our customers, our stakeholders, hey, uh, you can use all these open source packages on this VM. Uh, and uh, for the Ubuntu, it's going to be the similar idea, but we have extra 
uh, tools and extra packages that you can use uh, for the machine learning and deep learning analysis. So uh, what's the scenario actually? Uh, people needs, just need to click to deploy Telzer and once they clicked it, they will see the custom deployment page. Uh, if they have an Azure account or they can open a free account for them uh, and uh, they just need to select the region. We are supporting tons of regions uh, for this image. So this means uh, the Bioconductor users or any R users directly uh, create their own images and use this image for their genomics analysis. And they don't need to change the specific blob storage, the centralized blob storage. It's already there, it's open. If they just would like to download the content, they can download the content, so it's totally free. But if they would like to create their own uh, virtual machines, uh, they need to use this custom image. And this is the uh, screenshot for uh, once they log into the, the, the Windows uh, server uh, VM. So uh, this is the regular VM, data science VM, but once they go to their uh, lab folder, uh, they will see all the content that we are providing. So uh, they can, uh, the RStudio R and other uh, tools already uh, deployed in the VM. Uh, they have the genomics notebook, they can pull the public data set or they can pull the bioconductor Docker image. Uh, and uh, we are providing the GATK version and uh, the other open source packages and the tools for uh, their analysis. And for the Linux, it's same. Uh, so they just need to log into this VM uh, and use the content that we are providing. So the collaboration part is if you would like to, you know, provide these kind of content or if you would like to use these kind of images and share these images with the uh, lab uh, colleagues that you have or any data scientists in your organization, definitely that's going to be a great uh, use case for uh, sharing these uh, experiences, uh, the cloud experiences with the researchers. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have a public genomic data sets. Uh, this is another uh, announcement for us because we are going to uh, add more public genomics data sets to uh, this repo. So if you would like to share your data with the researchers, uh, Microsoft Genomics team and Microsoft uh, will provide a place for you so you can share. Uh, we will not own the data. We are just uh, sharing a platform for you to share your research outcomes or any project uh, outcomes uh, to the people. It's stable and it's scalable. Uh, let's say for SNPF, uh, this annotation tool. So they uh, move, uh, they are all um, annotation DBs trousers uh, and th th their usage is increased because uh, it's, it's, it's very uh, scalable. Everybody in all over the world can reach the data and download and use uh, with the notebooks that we are providing or the CPF tool that they're uh, building. So please uh, visit the genomics, uh, notebook, uh, genomics um, data lake uh, that we're providing. And if you would like to add more, so just let us know. Jess, it's your turn. Okay. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some of the other work our team has been working on for the last little while. We'll start with Cromwell on Azure and um, just a quick introduction on what Cromwell is. Um, Cromwell is a workflow management system um, originally from the Broad Institute and it's open source that allows you to run your scientific workflows and um, orchestrate sequential or a serial tasks or parallel tasks um, in the cloud and allows you to scale it out if you're running it on the cloud. You can also do HPC if you have a computing cluster or your local machine, um, but it, the local machine would have some limitations on how much it can scale. Um, but the GATK best practices um, genome analysis pipeline is actually based on um, a Cromwell workflow, which is written in the workflow description language, WDL. Um, so it's a way for you to run really large analysis tasks. Um, Cromwell and Azure configures an Azure environment that has all of the tools you need to run Cromwell um, in the Azure cloud. They would spin up all the required um, 
services like a VM that hosts this Cromwell server. It would spin up an Azure batch account, which spins up VMs of different sizes, uh, depending on how large your task is, and it can scale out infinitely into thousands of workflows. Um, there are some limitations based on what, which region you're in and how busy of a time it is, but it's um, essentially a way for you to run a lot of workflows in one go. So if you have thousands of samples and you wanna run the same analysis on them, this is um, a great way to do that. So like I mentioned, workflow description language um, created by the Broad is supported, but also common workflow language, CWL, is also supported. Um, here is a little diagram for from our GitHub page. Um, here you, you can see that you can submit your workflow description language file directly onto our backend, or you can set up an authentication system based on a storage account that you've created in the cloud, um, and then you can drop your files in essentially, which are automatically picked up by the Promel server in the back, and it spins up VMs in the background of whatever is the cheapest way to run your task, it'll find that VM and spin that up for you, um, perform the analysis, and then take care of um, destroying that VM. So all the results are then pushed pushed back into your storage account. So you can have your inputs and outputs centralized or in different locations, it's up to you. All right, um, and then I will quickly mention another announcement and then we'll go to web pages again. Um, so here, um, we just wanted everyone to know that this is a recent announcement. So um, just a bit of background, Terra.bio, so what is Terra? Terra is a platform um, where you can access data, publicly available data or um, regulated data if you have access to it from the NIH and ERA Commons. You can run analysis tools like notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. Um, you can run Cromwell as well. Um, and you can invite other people into your workspaces. So it's a way for you to perform scalable research uh, for all biomed data. And we recently announced a collaboration between the Broad Institute that owns the Terra platform, um, Verily, which is an Alphabet company, and Microsoft. So we'll be working together to, in the next few years to, um, on Terra to make it multi-cloud and um, bring the enterprise expertise of Microsoft. You can read about this announcement on, at this page. And let me quickly show you the GitHub pages. So this is the GitHub page for Cromwell on Azure, and all of the information is open source. Um, you can find out more about what Cromwell on Azure is, how unique, you, how you can deploy it on Azure. Um, you can do this on Linux or Mac or a Windows computer. Um, so there's explanation on how you can do it. There's also um, more dev focus instructions on how you can build your own and make your own changes and fork it out if you need to. But I think another interesting aspect is um, there's links to ready to use workflows. So all of these um, best practices by the Broad um, are linked here. Um, they're specifically created for Azure. So if you click on any of these, um, it'll take you to the pipeline which has the workflow description language file, the script that you're running. It has the inputs file that you can customize based on your inputs and run analysis. So it walks you through how to do that. Okay. And this is the notebooks repo that Ertl showed us before. And this is the announcement. So the Broad Institute is partnering with Microsoft to advance Terra. Okay, I think that was it from my side. Ertl, do you want to share?
Can we ask questions? Yep. Any questions until now? Yeah, so I um so yeah, I, I'm working on the development of pipelines on Widow. Currently we are we finished the implementation on GCP um, <clears throat> and we are planning to excuse me <clears throat> to do it on on AWS as well. Uh, today I learned that it's also available on Microsoft Azure. So uh, you know my problem is that right now we have a, an account on GCP and AWS, but we don't have it on Microsoft uh, Azure. I would love to have it available for the three platforms, so any of the potential users of this pipeline could use any of the you know of the platforms. We are this is what we are developing is an open source pipeline for the analysis of proteomics data. Um, you know, it's going to be highly innovative, and we are very ambitious. We want everybody to use it. So, but what, what would be the, the best way to do it? Because you know, we have limited resources. We wouldn't be able to <laughs> have an additional account on Azure if it's only for that. Is there a way that we could develop, test it on Azure, um, if it works? You know, to be part of the of the package. So, you know, we could also, you know, provide instructions on how to run it on Azure. Because again, we don't want to limit the the cloud environment. So what, yeah. what would you recommend? Yeah, so actually uh, I was I joined Microsoft five years ago and I was academician, so I have a lab and I have similar concerns in my projects. Um, so uh, we have different options. Uh, the first one is uh, definitely the trial account uh, for a month for specific amount. I, I can't remember specific, the amount, but 250, but it's it's good for the, the the demo sessions and it's good for testing purposes. The other thing is we have Microsoft Research uh, has a different uh, grant programs. So I will share all these links and maybe I will add to the slide deck uh, and we will share it with you, but we have different grant pro uh, proposals. You can propose your project and Microsoft Research granted uh, with those credits and different programs that I can recommend it to you. Uh, uh, but I will add all these links and the uh, relevant resources for you. So if you have any question or if you would like to submit your uh, project or proposals to these programs, just let us know. So we will be happy to share our experience. Uh, but we have different uh, research projects that running in this format today. Uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, thank yeah. you very much. This is unexpected. You, you know, I joined this forum and I, I didn't expect this today. So this is yeah. great news. Thank you very yeah, much. Definitely, definitely. It's same for the link in the. Sorry, yeah, I dropped the link in the chat that will take you to how you can sign up for a free account. Um, it's free. Uh, there's a few services on Azure that are actually free for 12 months, um, but there's there's also other resources you can use for a limited amount of money, $200 credit. And there's some services that are always free. So if you go to this page, you'll see all the breakdown of what's always free, how much are each things costing and, and how much credit you can get. Great, great, great. And I will share the research uh, programs, the grant programs for you too. That would be fantastic. So, yeah, uh, so this is the last slide. Uh, so we talked about the bioconductor Docker image, the notebooks, uh, the, the t upcoming Terra project, but how can we use all these tools? So this is the question for most of the, you know, the sessions that we are joining. So this is a specific end-to-end -end genomics workflow that we are uh, privately sharing with our stakeholders. So it's a pipeline that I'm going to show you the, small, the smallest part of the pipeline, but everything starts with fast queues for our world. Uh, and people can use the Chrome Melon Azure or Microsoft Genomics Service or any other variant caller, and they have a VCF or GVCF files. And this is the regular part, the secondary analysis part. But for tertiary part, so we have tons of open source options, uh, including Bioconductor, the Jupiters, and the other uh, open source packages or analysis packages. So uh, we usually combine genomics data with the clinical data and predict something with the machine learning or deep learning. Uh, this part is important because I'm always showing the bioconductor and the bioconductor Docker image that we have, uh, that we are providing in MCR because most of our uh, customers or stakeholders uh, are only using other services. And they would like to pull these Docker images in a safe environment like MCR or any other uh, safe environments. And we are recommended uh, the Bioconductor, the R, and the Jupyter Notebooks for deploying their own tertiary analysis part. So in this case, uh, our pipeline, end-to-end -end genomics pipeline, uh, has a different component. So I would like to just quickly show you how can we use 
uh, these um, pipelines on our environment. So this is the Jupyter Lab. That's the regular Jupyter Lab. We usually started with uh, creating the shell files. Uh, let's say the start VM SH is uh, is just a one uh, file shell file that deploy everything for me, uh, and I will be happy to share these shell files with you. It's private for now, but I, I will be happy to share it with you. So these kind of shell files created everything for me. Then let's say I need uh, to install different tools, including or pulling the Docker image, or installing R, installing Python, or whatever tool that we need. So we created a shell file file for starting VMs or starting the compute environment, run and install the tools that we have. And let's say in this case, the end-to-end -end genomics pipeline, uh, we are using Cromwell on the VM, not on our uh, Cromwell and Azure, but it's on the VM. So you can use the same codes on your local machines too, because it's the regular VDL file. Uh, and it will do a, a, this similar analysis or the analysis that I'm looking for, uh, for the prediction or data pre-processing. So uh, we would like to merge uh, the commercial uh, options to tools plus the open source communities uh, needs and requirements on the same environment. So uh, this is the end of our presentation for today. Uh, but if you would like to learn more, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out uh, from genomics at microsoft.com or uh, microsoft.com slash genomics. You can find everything that we share today uh, on our webpage. And thanks for your invite. I hope it, uh, it was useful for you too. Because we really enjoyed to collaborate with Nitesh, Martin, and Mike. So I hope we will have more once we have a, a real uh, outcomes from the Terra project. I wanted to answer Martin's, Martin's question about POSIX compliance. Um, so the one I showed you is um, based on SMB and it's not POSIX compliant, but there is uh, NFS preview that's out there. If you turn your PowerShell into NFS, then it is POSIX compliant. So I'm gonna paste a link into the chat so you can see the differences. Hey, thanks, that's great. Any question, any... Uh part that we can deep dive. So I have a question about the, um, the bioconductor Docker images themselves. So it, it might be that Nitesh answers this, but I can never quite remember what they actually include. So um, they don't include any packages, is that correct? It's it, other than maybe the bioconductor installer kind of package, but it does include all the system level libraries that will allow me to install the packages. Is that correct? Yep, that is correct. Cool. So the persistent storage is actually really helpful here because I can spin up a, a small a small image and install things there and then find out that I need more compute power later. But I don't have to spend a really long time reinstalling all of those packages again on a newer, bigger machine if that's what I need, right? I can I can save my library somewhere and then load it onto a new image and it should be fine. That is correct. So there's a there's actually a question in the chat as well from Eleni, so, um, which basically is asking if uh, any bioconductor package can be run in Azure at this time. Yeah, definitely. I guess the answer is yes. Yeah, definitely. Because at the end, this is just a compute environment. So you can deploy a Spark, you can deploy a VM, you can deploy any compute environment and use use it like your machine or any other cloud environments. You're welcome. So it's uh, almost real time. Uh, it depends on the server. By the way, question is how about cost analysis? How rapidly can Azure tell us how much has been spent? So it's uh, there is a cost uh, page actually the price uh, the, the consumption page on your Azure account. Uh, it's almost uh, real time, but for some services like Spark or the huge services, it takes time to show up uh, on the page. But it's very uh, 
uh, useful for tracking the spends that or credits that you are spending. Yeah, you can assume that every 24 hours is the latest information. Um, and uh, if you go onto the portal, it has a nice breakdown of uh, exactly where the money went. So which resource group consumed money and, uh, and you can then drill down and see which services cost you money. I think a big concern with frugal academics is, um, is not overspending their budget. And are there cost controls so that you uh, yeah. you don't accidentally yeah, go definitely. without your uh, you, for a couple of months? Yeah, actually, you have an option to limit specific resources and resource groups, so no one can exceed that limit. Or uh, you can put some alert, alert, alerts, let's say sending a text message or email at the same time once someone exceeds their limits, you can stop it, or maybe you can give a permission to continue their analysis. We have a budget too, by the way, as a Microsoft resource team. So we are a resource team, we have budget too. So we, are, we should be very careful while deploying all these resources, even if you are a Microsoft employee, yeah. And the cool thing about these container instances, at least, is you can stop them when you're not using them and not incur any costs. Except for the storage, right? Yes. Storage. It does cost money, yes. Yeah. Martin, you're muted. Um, I, I guess from what you said originally, um, there were some steps that took a, a number of uh, minutes to perform. But I'm guessing that actually, if you came in and in the morning and started up an existing container, that would actually be uh, pretty rapid. Yeah, um, the first creation is probably the longest time. It's still under five minutes, um, but it's basically setting everything up for you, so it takes a while. But if you restart a container that you've deployed before, um, it's about a couple minutes still. About two minutes, three minutes. Good time to get coffee and come back. Morning, yeah. <laughs> Then this idea of a co collaboration environment is kind of interesting, where you have this shared shared storage space, and uh, perhaps your collaborators around the world are each running an R Studio session on top of that, and simultaneously working through dis different aspects of the data. I guess Is that yes. a reasonable yes. scenario. Mm -hmm. Yes, for definitely. Sure. definitely. Yeah, and or you could be performing forward. secondary analysis and dropping files, and then um, as soon as they come in, you can go into our studio and start using them. Is our studio, I guess, the free version of it? Is it okay with running multiple copies on one? Is it one image, or if you're, I guess, if you're running multiple containers, they're separate machines as far as our studios. Because there's a license, right, with the Probe one to allow multiple users, multiple sessions and things, whereas we're kind of proposing working around that in some sense by having one central pot of storage and then lots of people accessing it through their own containers. Um, I don't know whether the answer is yes or no to this, but I just wonder if people have tried it. Uh, for the commercial version of Azure Machine Learning Studio, uh, there is a Jupyter Lab, and you can do it. Uh, on our R Studio is already integrated to the storage account, and you can uh, use it in parallel. Uh, but I don't have any information about this uh, R Studio version and the license. I suppose it's no different from running multiple Docker containers on your own local machine, um, and I'm sure some of us have done that, so it's probably fine. Um, it should be, yeah. And uh, we have a, a couple of uh, plans. Uh, Nitesh, would you, would you like, maybe not plans, but maybe ideas, collaboration ideas. Nitesh, would you like to share these ideas, maybe? Yeah, so, um, so one of the ideas is uh, using the Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, I'm yet to develop a deep expertise on AKS, but initially the plan is to develop binaries for bioconductor packages on uh, the Azure Kubernetes service, 
Uh, we have some amount of expertise on the Google Cloud uh, using Google Kubernetes engine. Uh, we want to shift them to Azure as well. And uh, these binaries eventually should be available to use on these RStudio images, uh, which are being launched on uh, the Azure container. So this is a similar idea to the RStudio package manager. I hope I've got the name right there. But the pre-built binaries for specific container images to speed up package installation and that. Yes, that's correct. That would be awesome because that's made a huge difference to how some of the containerized things we deploy um, install on, on Ubuntu and stuff for, for the CRAM packages. So that would be really cool to get that for Microsoft as well. And if I have another. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have one other slightly left field question. Do you guys have anything to do with the Microsoft R? Um, because there's this separate, I guess, sort of commercialized version of R. That, um, yeah, do you Excellent. use that or allow us to deploy that anyway? Yeah. So uh, it, probably you know that uh, Microsoft uh, bought uh, Revolution Analytics in 2017 or 16. Uh, that was my first year. So uh, there, there's another team in the Microsoft R part. Uh, they are in the product uh, group. So we are in the research organization, they are in the product group, but I don't have any specific, uh, you know, uh, the latest information about this group. Uh, but definitely we uh, have MRAM, uh, the Microsoft repository. So most of our, you know, customers use, the, it, actually it's the similar, the mirror of the crown. Uh, but uh, I don't have any direct uh, contacts in that team. But I will be happy to find for you if you would like to connect. But by, by default, you get canonical CRAN and, and R, right? You get the, the base version as your kind of default, right? Yeah. That's good to know. But sometimes our customers would like to use the MRAN or the Microsoft R because it's directly integrated to SQL Server and Snaps now. This means the uh, in-database R use with the distributed packages, the commercial R packages. So um, I know a couple of projects that you're using, but not for genomics. Okay, so we've reached the hour. Are there any more questions from the audience? Speak now. If not, then I would like to thank both Jazz and Erdl again for joining us. It's been really cool to have some different faces, different uh, ideas on, on how we can use R, see a completely different perspective on sort of um, where R fits in the ecosystem of, of genomics analysis and things. So that's been really cool. Um, it's also been really nice to see some different names in the chat and hear from different voices and things. So um, if you are a newcomer to this session, they happen every month. Um, if you've enjoyed it, um, keep an eye on either our Slack channel, the Bioconductor mailing list, or on Twitter, where we kind of announce what's going to happen each month and things. Um, and it would be great to hear from, um, see people back again if you've enjoyed this session. Um, so thanks again to, to the speakers and everybody who's attended. Thank you for Thank having you us. Nice. It was a pleasure. Thank you.